Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for uh, inviting us. Uh, my name is uh, Thomas Römer, and I am a, a partner and co-founder of uh, Base Life Science. Just the sound works, it does indeed. Um, and with me, I have Kasper. Hello, so my name is Kasper, and I am our, yes, our principal solutions architect. So I'm together with Thomas, I'm spearheading our product development and, and you know, our drive to apply AI um, throughout the value chain. Thank you. Yes, and uh, we would like to uh, talk to you about uh, regulated content, how you can get more value out of it using AI. So, uh, but more importantly, uh, I think we would like actually to spend more time talking about all the learnings we have had when we have been doing so uh, in the business. Um, because we believe there is a lot of uh, very basic important learnings uh, that needs to be shared uh, before uh, our customers and all of you uh, get started on the, the AI journey. So we're actually going to be very practical today we are not going to show too many uh, really advanced uh, diagrams over very complex solutions. Um, we are actually going to be very practical and hopefully share some advice. Yes, and just a little bit about us. We are a European uh, life science uh, consulting company. And I'm not going to repeat all that's up there. Just to say that uh, we work sort of in the interface between um, business, me, about pharma, uh, IT consulting and then management consulting. So in that space you find us and we work a lot with data. Data is part of everything we do, especially regulated data. So this is really our playing field. And uh, now we are going to talk for the next half an hour, but it's going to be a really boring session if there's no questions. <laughs> so uh, please stop us at any time and ask, right? So uh, this is an image that we often use when we have these uh, presentations. Super complex and uh, super fancy. But what we have realized, and this is, may sound a little bit um, obvious, but that is that when we talk about AI with our customers, we, re we often realize that what they need is something very basic. They need tools that uh, provide real business value. And that sounds very obvious, but when we see around the, our customer landscape and we talk to uh, our competitors, then they all face the same issue that this is rarely, this is, this is not a common thing that uh, all these new technologies actually provide these basic things that, uh, that really make a difference. To start off with an example of a simple solution that actually uh, provides uh, business value. So when you submit a new product, then as part of the whole submission process, you're going to receive a lot of questions from the authorities. And the answers to those questions, they are hidden away in documents, typically very unstructured, hidden somewhere in your content management system, that being Viva or IQVIA or whatnot. So uh, when all these questions start coming in, you have people who have to find those answers in a very short time. And the way it works is that you need to know who worked with that product at some point. So there is a lot of networking happening to answer those questions. People have their own Excel lists, folders, etc., to simply just do something that should be fairly obvious, that you should just be able to search for this kind of information. But that's not possible. And I think all of you, if you're from the industry of uh, working with the regulatory affairs, then this is a really common challenge. I think everybody has it. So what we set out to do was to figure out how can we make this information retrievable in a much easier way. So we set up a search engine that uh, makes it possible to, in an easy way, search for the exactly this, you could say, this, um, this information only in the specific scope of, let's say, one project. And it's a very basic little solution. We're going to talk about how it works just afterwards. Um, but uh, with extremely happy customers, because now they could actually find the stuff they were looking for. Uh, so you reduce a lot of time. And more important, you can start making a strategy because you can see, okay, when we get questions from the authorities, this is typically what they are about. So we can prepare for that the next submission. 
um, and you start giving consistent answers back to, uh, to the authorities because you don't say one thing to one project and then uh, you get a different submission to be later and you say something that's a little bit different because that was the reality they were facing. There was no consistency. Uh, and finally, when you start in, in regulatory affairs, now you suddenly have access to you know, the information uh, that's uh, relevant to, uh, to, to support this submission process. You don't have to spend ages getting to know people, run around finding the right person and so forth. So it's a little bit basic. It's just a search engine. But it's not something that was possible to do before AI started becoming a thing. And it wasn't really possible before you could start losing uh, cloud technologies to really support this. And it's definitely not possible by just using the inbuilt functionality that you find in your standard uh, content management system. So how does it work? Yeah, I am. So, so it's actually fairly simple. So, so there are two core components. You can turn off your mic. Beautiful. So two core components. Uh, the first one, uh, in, as indicated by, by the arrows up here. So uh, first element is basically generating a common data set based off of all the source systems that are relevant to your solutions, right? So in this case, it would be uh, your ETMF vault and, and your REAM submission vault saying, you know, the, it's, it's constant documents from here that, that we have to search in. So the data pre-processing pipeline basically extracts all documents in scope, scrapes out the content and pre-processes it for our uh, AI search algorithm. So that is step one. Then we have this intermediate storage in, uh, that's typically a client data lake, so a GXP validated environment where you can store not the content document themselves, but the content of the documents uh, in this pre-processed fashion to empower your AI. And then we have our, our user interface and our algorithm layers that taps into this common data set, which is really the, the driver of our search engine. So what does it look like? Well, the interface is super simple. There's a login screen, there is a search bar. You type in whatever free text search you might care about. Then we have some, I mean, your usual state of the art NLP methodologies of, of um, word embeddings that are purpose catered to the client document portfolio, so we train a model directly on, on the client content data to make sure that we have state-of-the-art search capabilities, but, but that is something that is you know, doable with fairly standardized methods today. The really cool thing is, is uh, the ability to bring the results to the end users. So uh, what you see here is you, know, you type in a query and, and you get from your documents in scope, this is, uh, for this particular solution, I think you're searching uh, among 160,000 documents. You know, these are the three most relevant ones. You can filter down on metadata that originates from your source systems. Um, you can expand, you know, what part of the content that is presented to me, what part of this document is actually uh, triggering the algorithm to say, you know, this is the most relevant document and then you go f directly from here to the source system. And this setup is a common setup for all our solutions, and it's super important that, that we are not building content management systems. We are building a thin layer of interactions around the content management systems, right? So we are helping end users tap into their source of truth, which lies, in this case, within Aviva Vault. Uh, and I, I think that that is um, important to recognize when, when building this, um, when, when implementing AI functionality, that, that you shouldn't you know, transfer source of truth for what you're doing outside of, of uh, the systems that are intended to facilitate that. Here's another example. So this is, uh, this is in the process automation space. So this is our uh, uh, content automation setup. Again, it's a fairly simple setup. It's a drag and drop like functionality where you can take documents or pictures, what have you, intended for a specific uh, content management system. You, know, you drag them into the drag and drop like interface. Then we have uh, 
an algorithm that's not too different from what is inside the search engine. Many of the components are shared, um, and, and the documents are pre-processed. Their classification is inferred, and their, uh, the metadata, the tags that are in scope for set classification are associated to the document. And again, it's presented to end users in this uh, thin shell of interaction just before load to the content management system. Right? Then you are presented with a load bot. You can see it here. You log in, drag and drop. Here are the results of the algorithm. Here is the classification that, that we found. Here are the core metadata tags. Here are where in the document was the algorithm triggered to retrieve set metadata tags for ETMF, for example, if, if there are any clashes between the content that you upload and what you actually have in your system. Well, here we go. Um, if, if there are clashes between what you have in your document and, and uh, what you have already submitted, it's flagged to you. Uh, for example, if your, your PICV clashes with FDA form 1572, um, you know, that triggers a warning. Um, now, and, and again, from here you load directly into, into the, the, the target ETMF system. So there, there are two spaces where this constant automation, where we're, it's widely in use. It's in ETMF where there's just a, a lot of content to load where people receive thousands of documents to put into a content management system. And then it's in the uh, customer relations space where the people who are filing documents are very far from the data consumers. And that means that they have to associate a lot of tags that are very far from their process mindset. So in this way, you can really facilitate the tagging that's necessary for the downstream consumers both systems and users um, of the documents you load, right? So, so, so these are, are examples of, of products we have living out there where AI is sort of at a very tangible level um, driving benefit realization around in and around content management systems. So what we are really set out to do today is, is to talk about how do you get to that? And to answer that, um, we have also brought an example of something that never uh, took off, because that actually showcases very efficiently the pain points of implementing AI methodologies um, to your processes. So uh, this was a project we did for a patent department. Uh, they have a lot of electronic correspondence that they wanted to file in an automated fashion. So it was way before we had uh, our base you know, constant automation. It was one of the first POCs we did in this space. And it was a wonderful POC. Now we had a, a perfectly scoped uh, setup. We had pre-processed data. We had, it, we had it well defined. And it was just, this is exactly what we want to do. We were told by the client. We went there and we did it. And the results were awesome. Like we had 95% you know, hit rate, everything was just exactly what we wanted it to be. So, so we, and, and you know, as part of that process, we, we could even through the analytics, see that the two different geographical locations of that process were filing data differently. So, so we could even do process optimization in the department with the AI analytics results. So, so it was just, everyone was happy and then, when time came to actually start implementing it, the business case was revisited and it was realized that, you know, there was a total of one FTE to save by implementing this. So, so how, how, how do you go through sort of a full scoping process, uh, get exactly the results you want, and then somehow end up with something that, that's never going to fly? Well, um, there was a great business case, but it was for something slightly different. So the very nice people, uh, client side, who, who really wanted this automation had of course chosen the, the most well-behaved data to begin with, and that meant the scope was too small to really make a big impact. And on the other hand, the maturity of the client side data governance and IT infrastructure was at a level where it was you know, fairly expensive to actually imp implement and operate the solution. 
And I think th this gap in, you know, what's, what does it take to implement and, and what is the cost is almost always the killer of very good ideas, much more than the capabilities of modern AI tooling. So we can always, always do the thing we set out to do um, with the tooling that we try out. It, it's always in this scoping of the solution that, that we get the point of tension and, and that, that, our, you know, that the solutions are killed off prematurely. So. So obviously, having a, a project like this made us think. I mean, we have to uh, avoid uh, getting into this trap again. I mean, I would imagine that uh, many of you, uh, especially if you work in a, in a large uh, pharma company, have been here in, uh, in this situation of uh, unfulfilled promises. So um, our take on AI is that it always needs to solve a real business challenge. Uh, that can be many things. That can be better quality or something that goes faster or you save money, etc. Uh, that sounds basic, but when you think about how many things are just being started because it's inspiring and it fits a strategy, then it's, uh, it's a little bit crazy. Um, and you need to kill stuff that doesn't work. I mean, not work technically because, I mean, you can make things work, but that doesn't really give the business value that you actually want it to do, seen from the user side. And the users are so important here. We have stopped doing things where there are not end users closely involved in a co-partnership. It's a prerequisite for doing anything uh, that makes sense in this space. And you have to be able to do uh, agile product development. We're gonna come back to that in just a moment. And uh, as Casper alluded to before, operations is half of this. It's, uh, we have been in the situation many times where we build something, it's ready, and then you have a year where you try to figure out how to make it work in a real daily setting with operational setup, etc. Because this is different IT. For some house, it, it seems that it's way easier to operate a huge content management system than this because it's smaller projects, they're fairly agile, they require a DevOps setup, and that's something that you need to have in place. And that we don't see too many places where you have achieved that maturity yet. So, how do we work with this? Um, we use uh, a lot of what we call design thinking. Uh, we figured it out after the first few projects that we needed to find a way to stay in a creative space for as long as possible when we work with this type of project. Because otherwise we would just take the first idea the customer suggested and just run with it and then build something that didn't necessarily really catch what was needed. So we spent a lot of time uh, in, in, you could say, an initial workshop mode. I'm going to come back to that in just a second. And the other reason why we have to have a special framework was to help us stop things uh, that doesn't deliver value. So that's why we resorted to a design thinking. And it consists of three spaces. The first space that we spend as much time in as possible is the ideation, where we have workshops together with the line of business, typically. And it's not only fixing the little problem that made them call us, but it's actually looking at the whole process up on a big board and then figuring out all the places where AI can actually make a difference. And then once we have uh, use cases, we go into what we call hackathon mode. So that's uh, making a playground, setting up the data, ensuring that there is systems to work with, get a lot of line of business in, also some managers, and then we just spend days building prototypes, figuring out, does this fly? Can we do this with the data that we have? That's a good question, obvious question. But also, when you actually sit with it and you try it as a user, will this give you the benefits that you actually want to get out of it? And then once we are done there, and that can actually take some time, that's when we then go into building a MVP. We never build a final product in the first go, because big chances are that once it gets out there and you put it into production, that it's gonna uh, maybe not fail, but it's definitely gonna be improved. So we rather have all these small iterations before you actually end up having something. And then out of this, at the end of it, when we're done with all this, you suddenly end up having a little portfolio of small solutions that saves a ton of time for the customer. And it only does that 
because the customer is really part of the, of the whole process. So it's, it's really different than implementing Viva or some other big system. Um, it's much more of a, of a journey. And uh, then we have, together with some of our customers, put up, you could say, a whole sort of systematic pipeline. So you do this in a systemic way. Go through the processes, you harvest all the use cases, you take them through the process, and then beneath that you would then have a DevOps setup that would then help you um, run these things. So, uh, and this works much better than the first times where we just sat with the customer, they had an idea. We spent half a year building something that wasn't really used. So, um, it's, uh, it, 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 it works uh, adopting a much more uh, uh, easy and uh, agile setup around this. Cool. So, last thing up is, is then, what is the toolbox you need in order to drive this, can you turn off, yes, thanks, in order to drive a workshop-based approach to product development? Like, how can you stay in this iterative, creative phase for as long as possible? So, what I stated before is that it's not, it's not pushing your AI capabilities from, from very good to complete state of the art that will differentiate whether something will work or not. It's your ability to impact, whoa. It's your ability to impact business processes, the right business processes in the right way. So to facilitate this co-creation, this, this, we are sitting together for a day and we are drafting solutions together. We have um, developed this component universe that are basically, I mean, it's, it's not brilliant. Uh, a lot of other uh, consultancy houses are doing the same. It's, it's our functionality is compartmentalized in fairly small sub-segments uh, that talk to each other in, in a predefined fashion. And that means we can piece together new functionality on the fly and present it in, you know, um, it can be fairly simplistic apps, but we can, we can make that app during a day. Right, so we, we come together in the morning with ideas, and in the afternoon, we actually have a functional search engine that works on some sample data that we have extracted from a content management system. So and this is a, a, a real case scenario for, for developing uh, the inquiry tool, right? So one thing is that, that um, where we as a consultancy house are super strong are uh, especially in the data pipeline and integration part up to content management systems. So that's some of the stuff we bring. But then we are leveraging managed services, uh, managed cloud services wherever we can. So for example, for, for text extraction, uh, all major cloud providers have something that is, is fairly advanced and does the job at all points in time. So there's no reason for us to spend time developing something that already exists. So we can focus on the small steps that's necessary to make the solution that interfaces to the business processes of the people we are talking with. Right, so this is how we are, are, are facilitating it. And, and uh, this is, is you know, a favorite picture of mine. It's hard to see what's going on but this just accentuates what I'm talking about. So it's, it's an email chain. There is 30 hours from, from this email to that email, and it's basically our CEO writing to our tech team, hi guys, we have a competitor who have made a, uh, they are um, commercializing a, a tool that allows you to make queries into a Viva Vault. We should be able to build something like that based on the tooling we already have. Then one of my colleagues says, I'm, I'm pretty sure we can build that. He asked products, hey, I believe the products are working this way, right? Yes. And then next day, uh, you know, here's our prototype for the vault, vault query tool. So there's, it's a total of 30 hours from conceptual idea is presented for the first time until we have a working pro prototype that you can then, in principle, start exposing to end users and optimize with respect to what you want to achieve. So, so this is, this is our you no know, methodology and, and our uh, you no know, components in action. 
it's a simplistic case, but, but it sort of, I, I believe it sort of accentuates what Thomas and I have been talking about today, that, that what you need is not to spend a lot of time optimizing your algorithms. What you need is to spend a lot of time really making sure that you are impacting the business processes that you care about in the best possible way. Thank you, Kasper. This was uh, with the 34 seconds left, if this clock is uh, accurate. This was the, our agenda for today. Are there any questions? If not, we are going to be here, so please reach out. Um, we'll happily share uh, our insights in, uh, in how to actually make this work in a daily setting. And I hope it was interesting with a much more practical angle. Um, we can always dive into algorithms, but it's, uh, I think this is the lesson that uh, the industry really needs to, to adopt uh, right now to take that next step.